those who cannot show up. Okay, we should be recording now. So go ahead and start whenever you're ready, Dean Smith. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us for this uh, book talk uh, and conversation this evening. Um, very excited about this program. I was actually pulling the book off my shelf a few minutes ago and I realized exactly how many books I have by Dr. Obama Seda on my shelf. Truly remarkable. But let me just begin by thanking um, our co-sponsors for the event, um, the Slavic Club, uh, Professor Kukta is online, um, the Center for Faculty Development, Professor Balkans with us this evening. We're very grateful for our sponsors to help uh, draw a nice um, diverse crowd because that will bring in a, a much wider and far reaching conversation. So um, this is an incredibly timely issue we are discussing tonight uh, with everything going on uh, surrounding Ukraine, um, the uh, policy of Russia, policy of the United States, Eastern European countries. Um, energy underlies a lot of the politics involved, a lot of the vulnerabilities certain countries feel in the region. And it's great to have a true expert guiding us through those conversations tonight. Um, that expert is Dr. Balmaceda, Dr. Margarita Balmaceda. I'm pleased to say that she's been a colleague and good friend for over two decades. Um, and during that time, she has amassed a body of research uh, that I could spend quite a bit of time talking about. But I just want to highlight just a few key things about that research and really highlight, as you'll see tonight, its policy relevance. And I think there's two reasons in my mind why Margarita's work has such a, a close relationship to facts on the ground in real world policy. The first of those reasons is that throughout her career, she has made sure to build the knowledge and skills she needs to investigate, investigate and understand the questions that she finds most puzzling. This can mean getting new substantive areas of knowledge, such as learning energy policy, uh, political science, social policy, economic policy, and how all of those things to come together, but also skills, in particular in Margarita's case, language skills. She speaks more languages than anybody else I, I talk with on a regular basis, truly amazing. And so that I think that's one key to her success. The other key to her success is her commitment to field research. Um, you're all familiar with the Fulbright program. She's had three, uh, but she's been funded by many other grants in the US, Europe, um, uh, truly remarkable. And um, there's a, if you look at her bio on the School of Diplomacy website, you'll see this one line in it that's always struck me, uh, that Dr. Obama said it feels home in almost anywhere in Eastern Europe. Well, I'm pleased to say that she feels at home at Seton Hall. She's been a tremendous asset to us, and we're very uh, truly pleased to have her on our faculty. And the conversation tonight with her, I think, will be informative for all of us. I know I learn something new every time I talk to her. Now, guiding us through that conversation is a very good friend of the School of Diplomacy. That is David Brancaccio. He is a long mem a long serving member of our Board of Advisors. Um, and he has given us a lot of advice over the years, and we're truly grateful for that. But also, David um, is a professional journalist. Um, you're probably very familiar with his work. Um, I think uh, kind of bookended by his time on Marketplace. Um, he began his career there. He went and hosted Now on PBS, uh, came back uh, to NPR and host Marketplace again. Um, early in the morning, I might add. So this is quite late at night for David. So thank you very <laughs> much, David. We're very grateful for that. Um, but um, uh, David uh, has um, played this role for us before. Some of you all may have attended our program right before the pandemic began when um, Nadia Murad was hosted by the school, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner. And David uh, guided Nadia through a conversation to help share her insights and tell her story. So we're very pleased that David's willing to do that again tonight with one of our own, Dr. Obama Seda. So uh, that's enough for me. I'm going to turn it over to David uh, to guide us through the conversation with Margarita. And I look forward to learning alongside all of you. So welcome and let's enjoy this together. So David. Dr. Smith, thank you so much, Dean Smith. That was wonderful. Um, I am really pleased to be here. And uh, let me do a, a more formal introduction of Dr. Balmaceda. Margarita ba Balmaceda is a professor here, as you heard, at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy and International Relations. She's also an associate at Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies and at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. 
As you heard, she's written extensively on Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Lithuania, and the politics of Russian energy. And she draws from long experience on the ground, as Dean Smith pointed out, um, in these countries. I wanted to give the list that I uh, was able to track down of, um, I think, some of Dr. Balmaceda's languages. Um, you know, there's English, Spanish, Russian, Ukrainian, German. Apparently, she has pretty darn good Hungarian, Belarusian as well. Her latest work, and that's why we are here tonight. I'll hold it up like I do on television. Latest work just published by Columbia University Press. It's called Russian Energy Chains, the remaking of technopolitics from Siberia to Ukraine to the European Union. And as the book explores, it's more than chains of transport to get crucial commodities like oil, coal, natural gas, and steel to customers. She explores chains of, and you'll hear about this, interest groups, some with great power in society and great power not just in Russia, but in other countries. This is a crucial point Dr. Balmaceda looks at. Now, given the headlines right now in late January, this is a gift, I think, for all of us to be able to spend some time with a noted expert on Russia and Ukraine and the ties of energy that bind and divide the region. Let us welcome Margarita Balmaceda. So we're all clapping, Dr. Balmaceda. Uh, just just assume um, this is, I think, the format here. We're going to uh, divide this interaction into four parts. First, I think we need to get to know the book, its thesis and Dr. Balmaceda's wider point of view. We're going to spend some time on that. Second part, let's go on a voyage together and take a trip three times longer than the route of the Orient Express from a natural gas field in Siberia all the way to Germany. Okay, third part, let's talk about this book in the context of current events. 100,000 Russian troops up against Ukraine right now. Are they there for show or for invasion? Fourth part, very important part, perhaps the most important part, your questions. Because uh, we, we are leaving time, not just a grace note at the end, but a, uh, a key component of this are your questions. So, Dr. Bamaseda. Reporters like me focus on the threat of Russian energy, especially during times like these. But these lifelines of energy that start in Russia are also, you write, an opportunity, a great cornucopia of carrots and other juicy fruits and vegetables um, as a counterpart to the stick. In what way is there opportunity on offer by Russia? Well, that, that's a great question. and. Um... That is, um, that is the great tension that underlies energy relationships in the region. But before I get to that, I want to say that uh, I have given many book presentations, many presentations about this book, but um, I have never felt so moved as today because I see among the audience some of my current students, um, at least one of my former research assistants, my colleagues, and this is a tremendous opportunity also to reflect on my experience at the School of Diplomacy. Um, I remember uh, when I was a young uh, assistant professor, uh, then chair Asafa Baryagava referred to me as the slow food uh, researcher. I think he was meaning like I was kind of slow in publishing. And um, he didn't mean it negatively. He meant that I took a lot of time to think about things through. And uh, I'm happy to see that uh, apparently it worked out. I have written four books um, <laughs> since I have joined the School of Diplomacy. Um, this was by any um, account the hardest to write and the more ambitious. So it shows that perhaps one learns something with time. And uh, I always wanted to be a scholar and apparently I managed. And apparently uh, the School of Diplomacy gave me the support and the means to do it. And I'm very, very thankful, not only to my colleagues, to my dean, but especially to my students who allow me to test on them a lot of the ideas that uh, later have come up in, in, in various books and, and in this as well. And I, I have to say that my poor students this semester, they are going to make a board game uh, based on this book. So let's see how that works um, and which, which molecule wins. But let me get back to your question. Um, 
temptation, opportunity, threat. So we have focused on the threat aspect of energy relationships with Russia, in particular the threat of a sudden cut off of supplies. But no less important is the fact that for countries and actors at different levels that have been involved in that chain of exports, that participation has been very, very um, profitable. And you can talk about that profitability at different levels. You can simply talk about the income that may come from transit fees when you're a transit country for natural gas or oil. You may talk about the profits that may come when you refine a product such as Belarus does and I wrote a separate book on energy and oil refining in Belarus and then you resell that at higher prices. You may profit when because of your political connections you may use that role in the supply chain to gain corrupt gains which are amplified by what I call arbitrage gains having to do with prices in different markets. Um, you may profit because access to those opportunities gives you um, what I call in my first two chapters power to, that is power to constitute yourself into a political, uh, politically important actor. So there are many, many ways in which that energy, that role in the energy chain gave many actors great power. And I think we, we need to keep that in mind. Because had it not been that way, first, Ukraine would not be worried about Nord Stream 2. Ukraine is worried about Nord Stream 2 because the status quo, that is Ukraine continuing its key role in, na in natural gas transit through pipelines going through its territory, gave it some advantages. Not only transit fees, but a particular um, balancing power vis-a-vis -vis Russia, a particular role in European politics, and these are all things we need to keep in mind, but also those roles also allowed Russia to, or Russian actors, to reach deeper into societies such as Ukraine or other Eastern European societies and gain what would end up being important situational allies which um, have come to affect policy very much, and we'll be talking more about that today, I'm sure. Yeah, well, no, I mean, this is a good time to start with that uh, without fully getting to contemporary politics. Russia has, it, it, it makes friends. It's not unlike the way that um, I suppose China is doing that global spending for the Belt and Road Initiative to build infrastructure projects because suddenly um, with that money uh, comes new friends. In this case, people with connections to these flows of different types of energy. Russia has friends in important places. Absolutely. And uh, if we look at the case of Germany, which today is uh, very, very much in the headlines as the crisis around Russian aggression vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine uh, continues to, to gain uh, strength, um, we can see that even in a relatively transparent and less less uh, often seen as corrupt country like Germany, very important players were associated and continue to be associated with the flow of uh, Russian, for example, natural gas. Um, some of the news from today about Gazprom using one particular type of construction to avoid EU regulations, we'll talk about that later, uh, tells me that, and also uh, the fact that uh, some regional governments in Germany are very, very deeply committed to some of these ties, for example, through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. But let me bring us back a few decades uh, into history. Uh, one difference between the energy corridors we are talking about, or I'm talking about in this book, and the Belt and Road Initiative is that they are not being built now. They were built during the 1970s and 80s as part of the Soviet initiative to bring to Western markets, massive amounts of natural gas and oil that were being produced, that were starting to be produced in Siberia. Um, why is that important? That is important because the building of that system 
And that is uh, very lovely uh, described by a colleague of mine, Ted Hoxelius, in a beautiful book called Red Gas. Um, the building of that system did not simply mean the building of those pipelines, it meant the building of relationships, but also it meant the building of a regulatory system, the entire contractual system for natural gas that we have seen in in Europe until recently. Now it's a bit uh, challenged. That's uh, something I discussed in chapter se uh, four and seven of the book. Um, that system was constructed together with that um, Soviet initiative to bring natural gas from Siberia to Europe. And this is also significant because Ukraine was key in that system that was built in the 1970s and 1980s. Of course, at that time, Ukraine was simply a republic of the Soviet Union. Perhaps it did not have real um, sovereign power, but without Ukraine, and in particular, without the tremendous system of natural gas storage facilities in Western Ukraine, that system would not have been possible. And in fact, the first supplies actually came from Ukrainian uh, gas deposits. So um, it's a very, very interesting system of connections that be, that developed in the 1970s and 80s continues to be important to our day. And again, important not only technically, because, but because it set the basis for relationships that continue to our day and for a governance and contractual system that continues to be very important today. You show, Dr. Obama stated, that the material attributes, essentially the physics of these different commodities, really helps define the shapes of how these relationships happen, how they're distributed, these networks. It, it matters when you're talking natural gas versus oil versus something else like steel. Yes, absolutely. And that is uh, kind of the main um, theoretical question that this book addresses. Um, and that was um, that was basically the, the the guiding question when I started work on this on this book. I was I think I was doing a book presentation on another book in, in Berlin and a colleague of mine and we were discussing how natural gas and oil are different because natural gas normally is uh, transported via pipelines. Oil can be transported via a variety of means. That is fine, and that is something I, I discuss at length in this book. But what I wanted to, um, what was kind of um, bothering me, what I wanted to look at is how do these differences also may affect domestic politics? So not simply the possibility of using energy as a means of external power, but also how they may affect domestic politics. And if you get into, into the chapters of the book, you will see how that also matters domestically. But let me stay at the external level for now. And um, let us look, for example, at, at the case of natural gas as compared to oil. Because natural gas is, well, a gas, it can only be transported in certain ways. It cannot be transported in a truck, for example. Um, it may be transformed, transported as liquefied natural gas um, via ship, but that's a little bit different. Um, and because of that, managing pressure within the pipelines becomes a really key issue. And that's why the, the, the title of my gas chapter in, in this book is, is called Managing Pressure. Why does that matter for foreign policy? It matters because if you do not have sufficient pressure in your pipelines, if the Ukrainian transit uh, system loses two thirds of its volume, then it's going to be very hard for that natural gas to flow at all. But moreover, it's going to be very hard for that system to function as a domestic supply system as well. So in this case, natural gas allows you to exert much more pressure um, than oil, for example. In the case of oil, because of the fungibility of oil, because of the material characteristics of oil, allowing it to be divided and shipped in a variety of ways, in Consumer countries may import it from a wider variety of sources. Um, and that that means a very big difference in terms of how you may use it for political pressure. Um, for Russia, this has a different side. It means that it can sell oil in a broader set of markets at world prices. And this actually means that for the Russian budget and for domestic Russian politics, oil may be more important. So just an example of, of differences here. So what was the book, Margarita, 11 years in the making, you said? 
Uh, no, I, I think it was seven years. It, it, I was thinking it started in a in a very cold night in Oslo. I think it was 2013 or 14. I had been working on many, many things and just the idea came together. And the, the original title of the book was um, Chains of Value, Chains of Power. And I really, really wanted the book to have that title, but uh, the publishers forced me to change the title to this horrible title, which I think is actually very good. It's, it's, um, it's you not know, that bad. I, well, that's the one thing, if you've ever seen a book contract, which you have, which is you don't have control over that. Yes. Uh, so it took a very long time for, for many reasons. Uh, first of all, I'm a perfectionist. Uh, if my name is in something, I want to make sure that I'm not going to be embarrassed by it. But it took a long time because the chains that I map in the book, they are not evident. They're not transparent. Um, the contractual relationships that are mapped in the book are not transparent. They are in many cases secret. Um, to find where the molecules were going, I had to do a huge uh, detective work. Then to choose which ones I was going to follow uh, in an exemplary manner was also very difficult because I had to think of my, the methodology and the theory I would follow. And then um, I had to learn a lot about natural gas and uh, oil technology. I just, and the hardest was to learn about coal mining and steel technology. That was really, really hard. I'm still working on that. I'm taking a couple of courses at the World Steel University. Mm -hmm. I flunked one, but I'll, I'll try again. Um, and actually, I had to learn a lot of that using materials in Russian and Ukrainian, uh, which I love because it forced me to take even more courses in languages. But it was also a an interesting challenge historically because a lot of the words that are used for some of the technologies are not the technical words, but are words related to the historical period when those technologies were introduced. So in any case, it was a challenge at many different levels. And um, well, I'm amazed that I was I managed to finish and to bring it all together. <laughs> well, I mean, seven years, and it's clearly not a book that was uh, research from the library. Your detective work was uh, not necessarily indoors. Tell me about how you did your field work. I mean, like some of this stuff seems to have like, I would say, national security sensitivities. And there you are finding out the diameters of natural gas pipes out in Siberia. How did you? Well, do uh, I mean, there, there are many limitations in what, um, what we can do in terms of field research, especially after 2014, uh, the 2014 invasion of Ukraine, because let's remember that Russia already invaded Ukraine. And <laughs> this happened in 2014. So um, I certainly was not able to do as much as I may have wanted. And um, I have to say that in particular concerning research in Russia, there are many, many limitations, especially because of the way this um, field is seen as a national security field. But um, I did uh, research in Moscow at the Higher School of Economics. I did research in Ukraine. I did research in Germany, um, and also this book builds upon my many, many other field research trips. Um, and I think in, in total, I have spent more than three years doing uh, research in, in Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, Hungary, Moldova. So it builds on many issues. But I also use some, um, I use a variety of sources. I don't want to call them um, unusual sources. I use commercial materials. Uh, yearly reports, um, radio transcripts. Uh, so it really forced me to use uh, all my knowledge, all my languages, all my antennas. I use many conversations that I cannot quote, of course. And um, I am lucky to be able to have a wide network of professional contacts in the region. I have given speeches at the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in the Bundestag, and I have been in God Forgotten oil uh, refineries or former oil refineries. So I think this book builds upon that entire the entirety of that experience and of interlocutors, whereby something really important is that uh, early on in my career, I I set for myself the goal of not trying to understand the entire post-Soviet world only through Moscow. So already for more than 20 years, I have been taking very, very seriously the importance of doing research 
in Ukraine, in Belarus, in other countries, and I think it, it, it shows uh, in the book. I also want to say that um, as an um, associate of the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, I was quote unquote subjected to weekly seminars where I was quote unquote forced to learn a lot about Ukrainian history, Ukrainian literature, um, and even when this book deals a lot with technology, it also raises important historical questions, such as questions about the West's sense or lack of sense of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. And in a sense, it builds also on that knowledge and awareness of the importance of history, which has slowly rubbed into me through my um, interactions with with the Ukrainian studies community, not only in terms of political science, but in terms of history and culture. Wow. OK, so some of it did. It really did stick. Now, very <laughs> just before we got started, when we were talking at the very beginning, you mentioned that your um, your students are working on a board game. It's probably going to be hard. And you talk very, very quickly. I want to be sure that everybody caught what you said. Um, it sounds like a competition of molecules. What you're probably talking about is molecules of energy. It might be a natural gas molecule, right? Yes, for example, I don't know how they will do it. It's up to yeah. them. Um, it could be a competition of molecules or it could be a competition of, of three countries. But in the book, the book is basically, the book basically follows three molecules going from Siberia to Germany, a natural gas molecule, an oil molecule, and a coal molecule. Um, for those of you who are in natural science, there's a little bit of poetic license here when I use the word molecule, <laughs> but um, let's leave that for, for a separate discussion. Um, but basically it's following them and it's showing us how the characteristics of the, it's showing us who, which interests with regulatory environments, uh, which nodes are these molecules interacting with, but, but also how the characteristics of these molecules, how the materiality, the physics of each of these molecules is affecting that journey. Well, let's follow a molecule here just briefly. Uh, natural gas. Um, it's um, it's living underground. Maybe it was part of a dinosaur at one point or a tree, <laughs> and uh, and it gets pumped uh, out near where Urengoy. I don't know how to say it. Yes, Urengoy in Western Siberia, um, and. Um, it's it starts journey um, in in Urengoy. It um, it's going to go about two thousand about three thousand kilometers within the Russian Federation. But before it gets to the border with Ukraine, it already has to deal with a lot of domestic Russian issues, such as the regulation, the regulation of the natural gas system. It has to deal with the issue of what to do with these molecules, to use them for natural gas export, to use them for quote unquote refining into higher value natural gas liquids, which may be used elsewhere, or to use them locally for electricity production. Um, this is happening even before you move um, to the border with Ukraine. Then when it enters the border with Ukraine, it enters the realm of both bilateral agreements about purchase of natural gas, but the realm of a lot of Ukrainian actors that historically have been um, very, very active in that relationship and not always in positive ways, sometimes in a very corrupt manner. Uh, when it enters Ukraine, it also enters a very unique, um, technically very unique natural gas transportation and technical system, unique for two reasons. First, because of the way large users are connected into the system, uh, which means that they are uh, directly connected to the export pipeline. And if you do not have, um, if you cut supplies, you will also immediately cut these large users, but also unique in the ways in which natural gas storage was incorporated into the system. So in many ways, if you look at Ukraine, uh, it's not simply a transit country. It's a country that is deeply gasified. It's a country where the export system and the 
domestic supply system are very closely intertwined, but it's also a country where natural gas storage is very important, especially at, I believe at the end of, of chapter four, I have a kind of postmodern uh, map of natural gas infrastructure uh, in the south, in the in the western Ukrainian area in Ushgorod. And basically the way that whole system worked was like a, because of the way the pipes were la laid, because of the unique, uh, geologically very unique natural gas storage facilities, were, many of which were previously natural gas uh, fields themselves, um, Ukraine acted as a kind of buffer, allowing exports to Europe or mod moderating the ups and downs. Um, if you have a colder winter, you may need less natural gas. If you have a warmer winter, you may need, sorry, if you have a colder, you need more gas, warmer, less. Um, the exporter may want to keep the natural gas until they can charge uh, higher prices. So that's a lot of the things we see in Ukraine. And then when we get to the to the border with the European Union, uh, in this case, in the border between Ukraine and Slovakia in Belka Kapushana, here you have the entrance into a different regulatory system regulated in theory by the European Union, but in practice, a, an area where until recently you saw a very strong tension between European Union regulations and the contractual agreements between specific companies or countries and Gazprom. So for example, at the end of chapter four, um, when I discuss whether Ukraine would, uh, whether Ukraine as a way to deal or as a way to try to reduce its dependency on Russian natural gas could purchase formerly non-Russian natural gas, although born in Russia, uh, from Slovakia, Slovakia was very uneasy about what to do because they didn't know whether they should follow EU law, which is what they should follow because they are members of the EU, or they should follow their contractual agreements with Gazprom, which forbade it from um, reselling or reversing that natural gas. So you have a very complex system. And then as you continue through Slovakia, through the Czech Republic, and then later to Germany, you encounter still another level of complexity um, because Germany has been the most active country in the in, in European Union in terms of moving to green energy. Uh, this meant the dismantlement or um, significant, a significant dismantlement of natural gas fueled power stations and a move towards um, solar energy and, and, and uh, wind um, uh, wind uh, installations, and that is why one section of the book is uh, is called "Waiting for a Rainy and uh, Dark Day," uh, where natural gas may be needed. So it's a complex uh, journey. It's complex in terms of the technology, but it's also complex because of the different regulatory systems that you have in each of the segments of this journey. Yeah, and the the students of Slavic studies on the call here know this already, but for those of us who don't know, um, even though um, w the origins of this gas are about halfway across Russia, they are really far away. Um, it's a huge distance. I, I, I looked it up. It, it from Uringoy to Moscow, if you were to drive, I mean, like you, if you weren't allowed inside the um, natural gas pipeline, it's 48 hours of straight driving just to Moscow. And it's 67 hours to drive to Germany. Yeah, it's, but and and that is very uh, optimistic because you don't know those roads in Siberia. Yeah. Um, it's gonna take longer. Um, so um, it's very, very, very far. Um, but another thing that is really important now that you have talked about distances, uh, both that natural gas, uh, the oil, and the coal molecules. They're both they, all the three of them are kind of born in Siberia and they are about 3000, 4000 kilometers from the Ukrainian border and they're about 4000 kilometers from the Chinese border. And this idea that they could sell those goods, those energy goods to China or to other Eastern 
markets as opposed to Western markets. That has been both a growing reality with some new infrastructure, but also um, something that Russian players and Gazprom have used to say, well, if you don't acquiesce to our demands or to our prices or to our contractual conditions, then we will sell sell it to China or to Japan. So it is it's in the middle of Siberia, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere, um, and it's kind of equidistant between um, China and Western European markets. Wonderful. I'm mindful of time. Let's transition to um, current affairs here, and we will weave in um, the energy discussion. But let me just start a little bit more generally uh, on Russia, Ukraine. Russia today found few grounds for optimism in the latest U.S. response to uh, Moscow's original demands. Uh, the, the Russian foreign minister was like, I don't know. I don't see much here. The U.S. says it still has an open door policy to NATO membership, which is something that the Russians do not want to hear. Are you expecting an invasion, Dr. Balmaceda, you think? Well, the only person who can answer that question is Vladimir Putin. It's going to be up to him. But I want to really emphasize that the Russian leadership and Mr. Putin in particular have in their mental map have in their toolbox and at their disposal a variety of means of intervention. They have a broad toolbox to draw from. And that toolbox may include um, la a large scale invasion and occupation, which is kind of what we are kind of hy hyping in the, in the Western press. But it may also include um, provocation through some of the regimes already installed by Russia in parts of Donetsk and Luhansk, which, you know, the so-called Luhansk People's Republic and Donetsk People's Republic, which are areas of Ukraine that are temporarily controlled by so-called separatists, which are uh, Moscow-based and where there's already Russian troops. I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and um, that that toolbox may also include the use of other quote unquote de facto states such as in Transnistria and Moldova. It may also include the use of individuals already active within the Ukrainian state um, in a kind of coup d'etat. And there were there were discussions and, and uh, some threats of that in early December, but also uh, last week through um, a United Kingdom intelligence report on that. Um, and it may also include the use of corruption as a way of to weaken a state. And it may also use, and, and um, I'm sorry I have not seen that in the news, but um, I listen every day to the Ukrainian news in Ukrainian and to the Radio Donbass Reali in Russian, although it's intended for um, Ukrainian territory. Um, and they were noting that um, Russia and Ukraine have continued their discussions their long-standing discussions about uh, uh, regulation of the Donbass situation. And it seems to me that Russia is already uh, quietly um, gaining some concessions from Ukraine on some issues here through the use of the threat of force. So the, the array of possibilities is broad. A large-scale invasion perhaps is the more uh, media impactful, but it's not the only way and this reminds me of of more directly more direct energy issues because um in 2006 and 2009 when russia cut the supply of natural gas to ukraine there were very high level impactful pictures of perhaps mr putin closing the pipeline uh, or somebody else closing the pipeline that's not actually even technically possible let's leave that aside um, there are many other ways of, of playing a role that may be less dramatic in terms of images, but which are equally damaging. And let's not forget cyber attacks on Ukraine um, and so on. So uh, he's very savvy. There are many ways in which he can intervene. And a large scale occupation of Ukraine is one 
possibility, but not the only one. If it's if this is the if this is seeing more than a hundred thousand troops amassed uh, at the Ukrainian border is the way to bring Ukraine to our consciousness and to get us as Western states to move. Um, uh, that is, I don't, I don't want to say that is good, but uh, let let it be that we understand in our consciousness. But this is not the only tool or the only means that is being considered by Mr. Putin. So, you know, if something happens that's uh, dramatic enough to get the world's attention, um, and there are many varieties of things short of invasion or invasion, um, there will be sanctions. Uh, Biden is promising it. The EU will be there uh, uh, to a greater or lesser extent. And that's going to annoy Moscow. And there could be uh, a reaction from Moscow. And there, there's concern that somehow, you know, you said the Ru Russia can't just turn off the taps, not technically possible, but could they put their finger on the flow in some way that makes Germany very unhappy in the middle of the winter? Absolutely. And actually Russia has been doing that. Gas supplies to Germany and to points west of, of Russia have declined. This is the so-called um, European energy crunch. Many people argued that this was done on purpose to push Western countries to agree to this certification or the, to, to give the, the final green light to the use of Nord Stream 2, that alternative pipeline under the Baltic Sea. So uh, certainly Russia can do that and, and it's already doing that. And is already doing that. Um, your screen f froze on my end for a crucial piece of that. Did it happen to anybody else? Yeah, it did. So, uh, Margaret, it was such an important answer. Uh, take yes. it, take two, okay? Just and see what comes out. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but you froze right during the important part. So, you said, I said, could they s put the squeeze on? And you said, absolutely. And then continue. Yes, so absolutely, and they have already done that. Even if they would not totally stop supplies, already since October, the amounts of natural gas going westward have declined 10, 20 percent, creating very important fears in Western Europe, creating an upward pressure on prices, which is a really big problem in terms of domestic politics in these states. So um, this is something that Russia has already done, and it did it, in my view, as a way to put pressure for the official certification or final green light for the use of Nord Stream 2. Um, and actually, I see a parallel in the way uh, this was done at the level of natural gas with what is being done with the troops around Ukraine. So basically, the Russian leadership was saying, we need Nord Stream 2 to be certified. Look, you need those supplies. Look what is happening. You don't have enough supplies. It needs to be certified. Of course, there was a dearth of supplies because Russia created that um, deficit of supplies. So they create the threat and then they present certification of Nord Stream 2 as the solution to a problem or a threat they have themselves created. And concerning Ukraine, they are um, raising the alarm about a possible Ukrainian joining of NATO eventually, uh, possibly at some point, but any Ukrainian desire to move closer to the West, closer to NATO, is a direct result of the aggressive Russian policies, including uh, the fact that Russia has uh, taken more than 7% of Ukrainian territory since 2014. So this is a kind of um, very interesting game and very interesting uh, rhetoric that is being used by the Russian side. Just a tiny quick tutorial. Um, uh, these natural gas flows used to come through Ukraine. Ukraine was exacting rents for those, um, and there's people that would benefit from that. Nord Stream 1 is a pipeline that got around Ukraine, 
Nordstrom Nord Stream one, right? Yes. Okay, and Nord Stream two is built, doesn't go through Ukraine either, but is awaiting certification and approval. Correct. And Nord Stream one um, was uh, started to to come into operation in 2011, and um, and Nord Stream two is basically parallel to Nord Stream one. But let me bring in a very small um, anecdote here. Um, I spent a year, 2011-2012, uh, in the beautiful Baltic city of Greifswald um, at the Krupp Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, finishing another book. <laughs> um, and um, it was amazing because I arrived there uh, early October, and then October 11, everything came to a halt. Everything in the city came to a halt. Why? Because 30 miles from Greifswald is the city of Lubmin, where the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 come into, into shore. And when Nord Stream 1 was inaugurated in October 11 or whatever, 2011, everybody who was somebody had to be there. The uh -huh. major of Greifswald, all the other uh, dignitaries. So it's just a small anecdote, but it tells you uh, part of the larger story of how many economic actors, state governments, in, in particular in that region of, of, of Germany called Mecklenburg for Pommern, um, are deeply integrated um, into the interests of, of that pipeline and into the economic benefits they may receive. So, I mean, eventually high Russian officials will have read your book. Um, they may know some of it already, but I want to ask you, do you think in effect Russia does a stakeholder analysis of the sort that you explore when trying to figure out how the chips will fall if it uses its energy chains um, for strategic advantage in this Ukraine situation. In other words, they have to consider uh, who their friends are, who their allies are, who wins, who loses if they manipulate the market. Um, that's a really, really interesting question. So, I mean, in general, I don't like to use the word like Russia because there are many players within Russia, many of which are big friends of Vladimir Putin. Um, but obviously, these uh, entities and these individuals have a very good understanding of human nature. Mr. Putin himself was a KGB operative, and you cannot be a KGB operative by just looking at your Facebook account. <laughs> and uh, not looking at people's faces and understanding how you can manipulate their own feelings. Um, so um, whether it has been done by quote unquote Russia or by specific actors such as Gazprom, certainly this has been done. And in, in some of my other work, I wrote a book. My, my first book in this series was a book about energy corruption in Ukraine. And that book, which was published in 2007, very clearly showed that uh, there were that corruption was a very good way of bringing together transnational interests. They were not the interests of the people, <laughs> but they were the interests of well uh, located, well connected people. And certainly, uh, by creating certain types of entities at that time, it was so-called intermediary companies. Um, Russian actors could reach in very deep into societies in those states. And, and uh, if we take the case of Germany, if you take the case of former Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, um, a few months after leaving his job as chancellor, taking a very important job at, at the board of directors of Nord Stream and later uh, board of directors of Rosneft, obviously there has been stakeholder analysis done there. Yes. Wow. It's amazing. Um, We'll be going to questions in just a moment. I do have an uncomfortable question. Um, it was um, the subject came up when I did an interview with the Economist magazine's um, Russia and Eastern European editor, who spent a lot of time in Moscow. He pointed out we didn't quite know what to do with the observation, but he, as an aside, he said, you know, as Germany moved toward more sustainability and safer sources of energy. Um, in recent years, 
And I think the last nuclear power plant in Germany is supposed to be off this year after the Fukushima disaster in Japan mobilized people against nuclear. That the move to green at this stage has had this unintended consequence of making Germany more vulnerable to Russia right now. Um, you could make that argument in the short and medium term because in many ways that move to green has meant using natural gas as a bridge uh, fuel before the entirety of the of the economy can be moved to, to renewables and um, that that can be seen as the case but I think in the long term there is no alternative but to move away from fossil fuels. And that's got to be something that's one of the I guess the last thing I'll ask before we get some uh, um, some of the other participants asking some of these questions, which is longer term, not medium term. Uh, these energy chains are in for uh, uh, a serious change as as the world embraces increasingly more sustainable sources and and the green conversion moves forward. Uh, absolutely, but we are still far from there. And uh, if you look at the latest data from China, um, the amount of investments in coal and coal powered power plants has increased. Um, the uh, fossil fuel carbon intensive ch industrial chains continue to be very strong. Many countries, including China, are able to export their most polluting industries and more carbon industry in car carbon intensive industries to um, countries outside. So that is uh, for the long term, but um, in the long term, absolutely there has to be there has to be this change. I am um, starting to think about my new projects for the next few years. And one thing that is clear is that the road towards decarbonization, that is the move away from CO2 intensive power generation and, and industries is going to be paved by a lot of interest groups and by a lot of lawyers. Because <laughs> when you look at European Union regulations, when you look at WTO regulations, um, that's an alphabet soup, very complicated. And lawyers have been very active in, in all the debates about Nord Stream or all the disputes about Nord Stream. In my book, I give a kind of very succinct discussion of the how this has moved back and forth, uh, but certainly with decarbonization, um, there will be even more of that. So it's going to be a bumpy road. It's a bumpy road. And a, need, a needed one, but a bumpy one. OK, there you go. All those things. So let's see if we can uh, take some of your questions. Elizabeth, help it. Uh, are you going to help with that, I guess? I will. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the chat, and I see I think one of our questioners in the chat has his hand raised. So I'll I'll let him go first. Jacob, would you like to start? You're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Professor Margarita, I want to ask you, uh, I think I have two questions out there, but uh, I might probably combine the two. But if you want me to separate them, that would be fine. And it's nice to see David Brancaccio uh, monitoring and moderating this uh, this uh, uh, in the exchange. Um, professor, with Russian expansion attempts in Ukraine, Georgia, and other former Soviet states, Turkey incursions into Kurdistan area, and Israel annexing some parts of Golan Heights and some areas of Palestine, are we sliding back to the age of imperialism expansion again? And is this game not very dangerous with the volume of an instantaneous availability of information, uh, which I term intelligence, to leaders of these countries that are, that are trying to expand into other areas? If you want me to ask the second question. Oh, sorry. Please. Okay, let, let me start with this one. Um, I think the question is, are we into a new era of imperialism or are we continuing a something that never stopped. Um, what has changed, uh, sadly, is that the United States' ability to play a role in these very complex situations, in my view, has diminished uh, because of the ways in which the United States lost credibility, 
because of the ways in which the US during the Trump administration lost um, or damaged a lot of relationships with European partners, which now is trying to patch up, but at a, not, at a, at a cost, as we see now with the uh, inability to, to bring Germany fully into a pro-Ukrainian coalition. Um, so um, unfortunately, this continues, and yes, it is, it is indeed very dangerous. And there was a second question, yes? The second question is that um, now um, looking at the UN United Nations setup, uh, the setup that we are operating today in the 21st century was, uh, was very adequate for the 1946 era when United Nations was established. And we have found, um, as you recall, that uh, the failure of uh, the League of Nations to stop the uh, World War II was why that League of Nations was dissolved. Now we have the United Nations fashioned after 1946 world. In this world, uh, United Nations has failed to prevent United States unilateral declaration of war on Iraq. And the UN has also failed in preventing various, um, because as you know that we live now in a global village, any civil strife or conflict can easily uh, blow up uh, into uh, very dangerous uh, levels. Does do you? Th I think this is my this is my thinking that the United Nations might need some tweaking or restructuring to actually deal with the digital and informational age and the global village where we live today. That's a really uh, important and, and interesting point. I am not a specialist on Middle East affairs, so I will leave that part of the question perhaps to my colleagues who know more about this topic, but absolutely. And, and even starting from the very fact that um, Russia inherited the Soviet seat in the Security Council, uh, but the Soviet Union was not just Russia, the Soviet Union was 15 republics. So what happens to the others? Um, those are very, very complex issues and certainly the United Nations is under great pressure uh, now to continue to live to its promise. And the, the answer is not clear whether it will live up to this. But thank you for raising those issues. Um, I cannot give a full answer uh, or a solution, but they are absolutely very, very important. There's some other thank raised you. hands I see. Yes, uh, Maxim, you're next. OK, thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> hey, Margarita, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this was wonderful. And uh, we're, you make us all proud, obviously. Um, here is the question. Uh, we're all on both sides of the Atlantic trying to figure out what Putin wants, what Putin thinks. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a losing game, I think, in many ways. Uh, but in the last few days, in conversations with my friends and colleagues in, in Russia, uh, here's an idea that was floated, and I wonder what you make of it, that this whole brouhaha with the, you know, the standoff on the Ukrainian border and uh, uh, Russian troops massing on the border, uh, it's not really about NATO, uh, but it's about Nord Stream 2, uh, that the idea there is to extract ironclad guarantees uh, that uh, nothing prevents the project from being uh, completed. Uh, and uh, sort of if... Uh, some blackmail, if if that's what it takes, you know, some blackmail, so be it. So the idea here is not to invade Ukraine, is not to, uh, NATO is not even that important, but what is important is to provide the safeguards for the successful completion of the project. So what do you make of this theory? Okay, first of all, let me tell you that um, my feed was frozen for, a, for about 30 oh. seconds. But okay. um, so, um, the the argument that 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 you have been um, hearing is that the key interest of Russia is to assure that Nord Stream goes through. Right. Um, well, I think that's an important interest for Russia, but I don't think that's the ultimate interest. Mm -hmm. I think the ultimate interest is to, in one way or another, maintain some semblance 
of a new type of Soviet Union or reconstituted Soviet Union. Uh, I would I would more see Nord Stream as a means toward that and as a way to exclude a Ukraine that is not favorable to that. So if you cannot bring Ukraine to the fold, then exclude it from and, and weaken it. Um, so I would I would kind of say that Nord Stream is important, but I would rather see it as subordinate to other goals. And, and, and I agree. Um, I don't think the issue is um, legitimate fears about what NATO expansion may mean to Russia. I think the the issue is a desire to maintain a level of influence that may be something Mr. Putin is comfortable with and cannot live without, but that is not acceptable in a world where, at least in theory, we believe in self-determination of nations and states. Thank you, Will. You didn't quite allay my anxiety, but that's uh, <laughs> sorry. Too much to ask. <laughs> you didn't really quite allay my anxiety, but that's too much to ask. Um, but, uh, but what is the what is the source of your anxiety? Uh, no, no, I just don't want a major war. Basically, that's well, like the rest of us. Well, yes, I mean we are all kind of. Um, now, the other way of looking at this would be okay. So if we say yes, we will let Nord Stream two go through. Would this stop? Mm -hmm. Um, Russian threat to Ukraine? That. I don't think it would. I would think it rather would give Russia more options. Um, but that's a very interesting way of looking at things, and I, I'm always happy to hear that kind of uh, a refreshing rethinking of the questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Franklin, you're next. Hi, Dr. Brahmaseda. Thank you for giving this talk. Really appreciate you know hearing uh, your insights you know on this issue and also about <laughs> your new book. I was wondering, so I was actually, you know, I've been reading a lot about the crisis and a lot about what's going on. And, you know, I was reading today um, a comment from a senior uh, conservative member of parliament in the United Kingdom, you know, about the problem of, um, I guess you'd say, like, the access that, you know, certain individuals in Russia, like, you know, that are associated with Putin, uh, the access that they have to, like, financial services in Western countries as a means to, you know, launder money, that sort of stuff. Um, I was wondering, so, you know, we're in this situation where it seems like, you know, war is pretty possible. There's not a lot of means to, you know, stop it necessarily. I mean, do you think that they're, you know, in terms of, um, you know, tamping down on Putin or anything that he's doing, do you think that there's a way to do that, you know, through like, you know, specific, like direct, like financial pressure on like individuals that are like influential within Russia in a certain sense? That, that's a really good question, and actually that is something that the West has been thinking about since 2014, uh, when when Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, occupied Crimea, set up puppet regimes in, in Luhansk and Donetsk, um, and some sanctions were in, imposed, which were, many of them were targeted at specific individuals, and I think that showed that that kind of sanctions targeted at individuals was not sufficiently effective. Those sanctions did not really lead to any results, obviously, because Russia is still there. Um, but what you may be indirectly referring to is the so-called nuclear weapon of sanctions, excluding Russia from the uh, SWIFT banking system. And that could be very significant because it would be very, make it very, very hard for Russia to export some of its commodities, some of its goods, to access some goods, to access financing, uh, to export uh, oil. So that, um, I think, could be uh, very painful. And uh, I don't know whether it would change the situation if there is a large underground invasion, but it may, may perhaps um, dissuade Russia from invading at a large scale in the first place. SWIFT is uh, managed in Switzerland, probably, Basel or something like that? I think it's managed in three different cities, but it's an international system. I see. Okay. Belgium, I think. And there was a Thank there you, was Dr. Rollins. There's some American press reports this week uh, that the administration is considering targeted sanctions on Putin himself and his own assets. Yes, exactly. Tatiana is next. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Baba said that it's a very interesting talk. I have one question. If not, if not Russia, natural gas and oil uh, for European Union, what would be the other alternative for you for the European Union? Okay, so uh, thank you for the question, and it's wonderful to have you here. I really appreciate you coming, and I, I really appreciate your your question. So. The European Union states already have a variety of sources of natural gas and oil. Um, historically, Russia has provided about 30 percent, 35, 40 percent of natural gas, of oil. It continues to do so, but European Union countries have imported natural gas and oil from Norway, uh, from the Maghreb, North Africa, um, and uh, also from domestic sources in, in each of the countries. So they are a number of other sources available. They are not gigantic, but some of them are available. And of course, the source that the US is making reference to the US government is the possibility of accessing US, but also um, Saudi and other natural gas through liquefied natural gas supplies, which is natural gas that has been liquefied by bringing it to very low temperatures so that it becomes liquid. and that could be an alternative, but it's not a very easy alternative because the cost of these supplies is about 20% higher. The, the way that market works is also different, and you need special terminals to receive that natural gas, and those terminals um, are far uh, and, and, and um, not, not too many of them uh, are existing there. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a it's an important uh, problem, important issue, but there are some possibilities available. Thank you. Thank you. Nathaniel is next. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Margarita. This is a wonderful talk, and it's really inspiring to hear the, the depth of your research and and your insights uh, on, on this matter that we're all thinking about. Um, so it's re really great. Um, I want to kind of take you down a little bit into the weeds of Ukrainian politics. And one thing I know you, you've talked about and worked on in the past is the is the corrupting effect of these um, rents that are extracted through the transport of gas and, and the way that this um, source of money has a kind of distorting effect in terms of internal relations within Ukraine. Um, and so I'm wondering sort of, you know, with Nord Stream 2 and the possibility of cutting off this transport, who stands to win and who stands to lose inside Ukraine from this disruption? And to what extent is this um, connected to perhaps pressures and incentives that Russia may be imposing on Ukraine? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by the, the kind of sort of ambiguity of the seeming reaction in Ukraine. You would expect there would be more noise, more people. Uh, at the higher level speaking out, and I'm wondering if there isn't something else going on here, these kinds of, uh, you know, carrots and sticks that, that may be connected with the, you know, the, the stakes of, of losing this source of income. So I wonder, any thoughts on those matters? Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, before I answer the question, I want to say if any of you bought this book, reach the acknowledgments because Nathaniel and his wonderful uh, spouse, Olesia Bovina, are named in the acknowledgments, but for a very wonderful reason. They have been tremendous inspirations for me throughout the years, and I hope they will continue to be. So do look up. I don't think they're in the index, but they're on page uh, 11 in the, in the acknowledgments. So um, <laughs> I think your question uh, reminds me of a question sometimes people ask me, well, if natural gas transit has been such a source of corrupt funds for Ukraine, wouldn't it be better for Ukraine not to have that natural gas transit? And let me first answer that question and then perhaps answer more directly the questions you raised. Perhaps that could be an answer if we look at it simply in political terms, but the way natural gas transit works or worked, it meant not only that those players could make a lot of profit from that, 
from those from that variety of intermediary roles, but natural gas transit allowed Ukraine to have a triangulation, triangulation of power relationships between Ukraine, Russia, the European Union. It allowed Ukraine not to be so alone, so much left, left on its own vis-a-vis -vis Russia because it gave European Union states a stake in that relationship, if only because of transit reasons. And even if you would argue that corruption has been very negative for Ukraine, that other aspect of energy transit uh, continues to be important. Now, concerning who would win and who would lose within Ukraine, um, I think we would need to have kind of a separate story about how <clears throat> those corrupt interests have remade themselves in the last years. So a lot of the traditional system of corruption that I uh, dissected in, in tremendous detail in, in, in my book on energy politics, uh, Dependency and Corruption, my 2008 book, uh, a lot of that system was predicated on two things. Um, a system of prices that did not differentiate between um, that did not charge separately for transit. So a system of pricing that was very untransparent and also predicated on very different prices in Ukraine, in Russia and in the European Union. So in that classic system, which in its classic form, in my view, existed from around 1994 to 2004 and perhaps 2011, A lot of profits, a lot of corruption profits could be made through what I call, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the word, but through the gains that you can make when you have a different pricing for a good, uh, arbitrage, arbitrage gains. Arbitrage. arbitrage. Arbitrage, arbitrage, yes. That was going to be my next book. <laughs> yeah. Before, the next book before the next book. Um, and that system of arbitrage, when you had, for example, natural gas that was sold at $10 per thousand cubic meters in Russia, $30 for schools in Ukraine, $100 for enterprises in Ukraine, $200 uh, in the Slovak Republic, that difference in pricing, that arbitrage, allowed a tremendous system of corruption to evolve. With the massive increases in natural gas prices for Ukraine already from 2011 with the famous Timoshenko agreements, a lot of the arbitrage possibilities have gone away. And our delightful oligarchs, and by the way, there is one oligarch who is a hero in each of my chapters, Mr. Firtash in the gas chapter, Mr. Kolomoisky in the oil chapter, and Mr. Akhmetov in the coal chapter, our beloved oligarchs have found new ways to, to make profits and to use the corruption in different ways, including, for example, through control of the electricity systems, through control of so, uh, solar panels in the case of Akhmetov. So um, it's a somewhat of a different, of a different game. Um, I believe there was a second aspect of your question, and that was uh, Uh, you have to remind me. Well, I guess I, I, what I was noticing, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but there's a kind of strange reticence within Ukraine um, in terms of the reaction to this Russian yes, threat. Yes, yes, yes. They're not speaking yes. halfway as loud as we are about, and, and whether this is connected at all, perhaps to the role of the oligarchs or to these incentives or um, how this fits in. Um, I have no doubt I think we may have lost you, Margarita. Have a variety of yes. um, are we back? Yeah, it seems like are you okay. yeah, I think you're back. Yes. So I have no I had no doubt that our beloved oligarchs, of which three of them are, are heroes in my chapters, um have a variety of interests that go well beyond Ukraine. 
And in fact, one of the challenges Ukraine has faced after Russia's invasion in 2014 was that it relied a lot on those oligarchs to defend itself. Even it gave, it offered three of those oligarchs the govern governorships of very important regions of Ukraine. While we knew that those oligarchs did not have Ukraine's interests uh, first and foremost in their consciousness. So that's a, a very complex issue. And I have no, I have no, um, I have no hopes and I'm not so naive as to think that somebody like Mr. Firtash or Mr. Akhmetov thinks in terms of Ukrainian interests. But uh, concerning the issue of why it seems that the government in Ukraine is so calm, I don't think it has to do so much with oligarchic influence. There is oligarchic influence. Oligarchs certainly are not thinking just about the Ukrainian national interest. I think it has to do with a psychological game not to show themselves, not to show that they are desperate. I don't think Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, wants people to start running to the borders of Ukraine. Um, there has been a lot of um, key individuals in Ukraine who have said that they are prepared to defend their country if needed. I don't know if that will be the case or not, but I think um, the government wants to make sure to present a straight face and a calm face because otherwise you will get a lot of reactions also in the markets. Um, you can get a kind of snowball effect that could create even more problems even before an, in, in, um, a Russian move. And, you know, maybe maybe in Moscow they are, they or, or Mr. Putin is playing that game, that psychological game, and maybe um, Mr. Zelensky believes that the best way to react to that is by uh, pretending to be very calm. Thanks. That makes a lot of sense. Irina is next. Thank you very much. Dr. Amasaya, it was an extremely interesting topic. Thank you very much for bringing it up. And I have a very, very naive question maybe for you because I'm not very familiar with this topic. However, as you know, there are so many different uh, streams that Russia is using to deliver the natural gas to Europe. Uh, South Stream and North Stream 1, as you know, and North Stream 2 uh, started as a very, very commercial product. So my naive question is why suddenly it became such a hot political topic? May I ask you to explain me? Yes, well, I think many people would disagree that it was started as a commercial project. Um, so. Uh, among, Ameri among American um, political scientists, I have been one of the most cautious in, in terms of my assessments of Nord Stream. I was never um, kind of crying wolf <laughs> in the past. But if you really look back, you, you have to understand that if you look at natural gas transit um, from a purely technical uh, perspective, the Ukrainian gas transit system was perfectly sufficient to transit this gas and more efficient and, and shorter than Nord Stream 1 or 2. So I think many people would argue that from the very beginning, Nord Stream 2 was a political as well as a commercial project, um, or many would agree that it was first and foremost a political project. And when I look at it, within the context of all my other work, I can see that already from 2005, the Russian leadership was trying to um, move away transit routes away from Ukraine, even away from long-term ally Belarus, away from the Baltics, um, in a way that spoke not only of commercial interests, but also political interests. So I think what has changed is that there is more awareness now of this, and in particular, there has been um, and there, there, we are witnessing, as we speak, important change concerning perceptions of Nord Stream 2 in Germany. Provincial governments, such as the government of Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, where Lubmin and Greifswald are located, uh, continue to be very tied to the project. But German public opinion and uh, the German uh, different 
top German politicians, in particular with the new coalition that came into power in December, a social democratic green coalition. There is finally, finally an opening to understanding that Nord Stream 2 is not only a commercial project. So I would say I don't think it's a sudden change, it's more a change in perceptions, in particular in Germany. And obviously your question was not very naive. You know very much about natural gas transit. You mentioned all the key pipelines. So that's uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Zoe is next. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Balmaceta, for giving this presentation. I'm looking forward to see, or I enjoyed that this was a little insight into your um, or a significant insight into your post-Soviet politics class, which I'm in involved in now. Um, my question about this particular session was, if Ukraine did join NATO and did go through the process, ignoring the impending invasion, would it affect the functionality of the Nordstrom II? And separately, would it affect the energy independence of Ukraine? Since, like you said, all almost all energy, even Germany's, ultimately comes from Russia. Yes, uh, ju just a quick uh, clarification. I didn't say that almost all of German energy came from Russia. It's about 30 um, percent, just just to clarify that. So how would all of this change if if uh, Ukraine were to join NATO? Well, um, let's just kind of take a step back here. And let's remember, if, if Ukraine were to join NATO, that's going to be a very, very, very long process. So it's not going to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. Ukraine is not prepared for this. Finally, there is a plural, pl plurality of people in Ukraine who want Ukraine to join NATO. For until recently, not even the majority of people in Ukraine wanted Ukraine to join NATO. Um, but where um, I think before Ukraine would join NATO, because this would take so long, something would have happened to Nord Stream 2. Either it would have been certified or not certified. Um, what would joining NATO mean in terms of Ukrainian energy security in general? Um, it would give Ukraine a stronger, broader sense of its security, uh, a stronger set of allies to rely on. In some cases, this, in, for example, in the case of Germany, this may mean uh, feeling that that's then it's fine to be energy dependent. Um, uh, it would give uh, it would simply give Ukraine a, a, a broader set of supports in case of crisis. So it would not affect energy interactions directly, but it would give Ukraine a broader stability in its foreign interactions. So that's kind of my uh, my short answer to your question, but I hope we will discuss this in our course throughout the semester. Thank you so much, uh, Zoya, for coming to this uh, event. Thank you very much, Professor. So I would like to um, finish with one last question, and I, uh, one of our guests has had a hand up and down throughout the question and answer session. So I want to give the guests a, an opportunity if they're having connectivity problems, and that's why the hand went down. That um, Drilan, if you would like to ask your question now, you are welcome to unmute. OK, hello, Professor. I uh, hello. was just a little nervous. I, I wasn't sure if maybe what I wanted to ask was a bit over coercive. I don't want to sound like that, but do you think as in 1982 when the alleged CIA had an attack on a pipeline in Russia, Siberia. Do you think that maybe if if you, this is a game, as you're saying, with Vladimir Putin, is sabotage um, a real answer? And if it's not, what what other methods could we think of? Um, I need uh, to ask you to repeat part of it because I I missed part what you said about 1982. OK, um, I said in, in 1982, the Russians invaded uh, Afghanistan on um, a call for intervention. And allegedly, there was a CIA uh, sabotage operation on a Trans-Siberian pipeline. And I just want to ask if 
maybe could there be a correlation? Like, can we um, do that today, or is that bad? Um, so who would be sabotaging what? Um, because what we have seen actually, we have seen situations where some technical disrepair in the pipelines, for example, in Lithuania in 2006, was used as an excuse by Gazprom to stop uh, supplying or transiting through Lithuania. So uh, also what we could see a situation where there may be a Russian orchestrated Russian orchestrated attack on Russian friendly forces in one of the occupied areas, Luhansk or Nietzsche, and that be used as an excuse. I don't know whether you are referring to that or whether you are referring to something specifically on a pipeline. Uh, maybe you could uh, clarify that. My question is just more because you were speaking upon how Vladimir Putin would be is playing a game um, as he comes from KGB. And do you think that making such an like if the West were to think of planning such an operation, would it be how, would it be as powerful as what he's doing with the Green Martian men mm -hmm. since 2014? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think Mr. Putin is playing a game, but he has more than 100,000 forces on the border, and, and that part is not a game. Um, I do not think that um, at a lock that a localized um, operation by the West on a Russian on some Russian energy infrastructure would be very effective. I think the the stakes are, are more higher, and uh, we need um, much more comprehensive security guarantees and weapons to Ukraine. Um, I, again, I'm not sure whether I totally understood the 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 analogy. But in, in my sense, I think, uh, I believe um, some sabotage on, on Russian energy facilities would, would not be effective. That, that is my, my personal view. Thank you so much for the question. All right, so That's let's fine. leave it there. Let's leave it there and say thank you to Dr. Margarita Balmaceda and the wonderful book that we commend to all of you, Russian Energy Chains. And, um, you know, we'll do a virtual applause for Dr. Balmaceda. That was incredible. Uh, uh, insightful, useful, right on the news um, information that will inform our next few weeks and also our next few decades. Um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And let's turn it over to Nicole, who has a brief message from the Slavic Club. Hi everyone, um, I just wanted to say thank you to obviously Dr. Balmaceda and everyone else who came to make this event happen. Um, it was very interesting and I know